Roll for Crit presents How to Play Star Wars Rebellion in 5 Minutes or Less or More. Star Wars Rebellion is the game of space combat, interplanetary subterfuge, and galactic domination, designed by Cory Kaneska and published by Fantasy Flight Games. In Star Wars Rebellion, one player controls the Rebel Alliance and the other the Galactic Empire. The Empire's goal is to locate and destroy the Rebels' hidden base, while the Rebels' goal is to improve their reputation along this track using objective cards. Each player will begin with a faction sheet, an action deck, a mission deck, some starting leaders, and a whole bunch of units. Players will be assigning these units, along with their own loyalty tokens, to specific systems on the board, determined by probe cards drawn during setup. Then the Rebel player gets to choose one probe card, depicting a system in which they'd like to establish their secret base. This card is tucked underneath the board and is a secret to the Empire. Rebels also draw one objective card that only they can look at. Both players get to draw two starting action cards, plus their opening hands made up of four starting mission cards and two more from the tops of their mission decks. The main board is made up of eight regions, separated by orange lines, and within each region are four smaller systems, separated by white lines, each system containing a planet. A planet with resource icons and a space for a loyalty token is known as a populous planet, while those without are called remote planets. Populous planets can be neutral, loyal to one side or the other, or subjugated by the Empire. If a player gains loyalty in a system that is already loyal to the other side, then that token is removed instead, and they'll have to gain loyalty there again in order to add their own. This space represents the hidden rebel base. It technically belongs to one of the board systems, but which one is known only to the rebel player? Each round of rebellion is made up of three phases, assignment, command, and refresh. In the assignment phase, the rebel player begins by choosing one of the mission cards in their hand and placing it face down in front of them. Then, one or two of the leaders in their leader pool can be assigned to that mission by placing them on top of the card. Each leader has a number of skill icons in one or more colors, representing diplomacy, intel, spec ops, or logistics. In the top left corner of each mission card is a symbol matching one of those skill types and a number. In order to carry out the card's effects, you'll need to have a matching number of the indicated icon across one or both leaders placed on the card. For example, the infiltration card would require at least one intel icon to be present. These card effects won't come into play during this phase, however, they're only placed face down with leaders assigned to them. Once the rebels have assigned all the leaders they want to as many missions as they want, the imperial player does the same with their missions and leaders. Then the command phase begins. Starting with the rebels, players go back and forth taking turns, choosing to either reveal one of their missions, activate a system on the board, or pass. Let's start with revealing one of your mission cards you played earlier. On your turn, you can flip it face up, read its instructions, and carry them out. Typically, missions will reference a specific system. Place that card's assigned leader or leaders to the system as indicated. Sometimes this will be any system of your choice. Other times, there will be more specific conditions. If a rebel mission has you placing a leader in the rebel base, it refers to the special rebel base space and not the system where it is secretly located. After choosing a system, the card will instruct you to either attempt or resolve the mission. If it says resolve, simply carry out the card's effects as written. If it says attempt, then the other player has the chance to oppose the mission. They can do so by taking one of the leaders remaining in their leader pool and placing them in the relevant system. Now both players roll a number of dice equal to the number of skill icons matching the mission's requirement across their leaders present in that system. This symbol represents one success, and this symbol represents two. If the opposing player rolls an equal number or more successes than their opponent, they successfully abort the mission, canceling the card's effects. Otherwise, the mission is carried out. Missions can have a variety of effects, including moving and affecting units, changing a system's loyalty, and looking ahead at cards. If a mission shows a picture of a specific leader in the corner, that leader gets a bonus if they're the ones assigned to that mission. They'll get two extra successes if it's an attempted mission, or some other special ability if it's a resolve-type mission. Starting cards with this symbol return to your hand after activation, while all others are discarded. Aside from revealing a mission on your turn, your other primary option is to activate a system. To do so, choose a leader from your pool featuring tactic values, these numbers in the bottom corners, and place them into any system on the board. Then, you can move any of your units in adjacent systems into the one with your newly placed leader. However, if an adjacent system already has one of your leaders in it, those units can't move out of that space. Units also can't move through these thicker borders with an orange hue. Your two primary unit types are ground units and ships. Ground units need a ship to carry them if you want to move them to a new system this way. Each ship has a transport capacity indicated on your faction sheet, which tells you how many ground units it can carry during a single movement. 
TIE fighters aren't built for long-range travel, and so must be carried by a larger ship, just like ground units. If an Imperial ground unit enters a system that is not loyal to the Empire already, it becomes subjugated, as represented by a subjugation token. If there's a rebel token there already, then the subjugation token goes on top of it. The subjugation token is removed if the Empire later on does gain loyalty there, or if their ground units leave the system. While the Empire's units cannot move onto the special rebel base space, rebel units can move in and out of systems adjacent to it, according to its secret location. Of course, this will give the Empire an indication as to where their base might be located. If any Imperial ground units move into a system, the rebel player immediately announces whether or not their secret base is there. If they did find the secret base, any units on the rebel base space are moved to the newly revealed location. Regardless of the secret base, any time units move into a system containing enemy units, combat occurs. Here's how it works. First, if a player doesn't have a leader in that system with tactic values, they can add one from their leader pool now. Based on these values, players can now draw tactic cards, which come in two flavors, space and ground. Draw a number from each deck according to the values on your leader. If you have multiple leaders, only use the highest value for each type amongst them all. If only one player has ships in the system, or if neither player has ships in the system, then players don't draw space tactic cards as there won't be a space battle. The same holds true for ground tactic cards in the case of ground units. If both players have ships, resolve a space battle. First, the player whose turn it is rolls a number of dice according to their ship's attack values as indicated on their faction sheet. They can have a maximum of five red dice and five black dice according to these values. After rolling, they can play any relevant tactic cards, or if this symbol was rolled, spend that die to draw a new tactic card from the relevant deck, which can be used right away if desired. Some tactic cards require this die symbol to be spent in order to carry out their effects. The other symbols represent damage. This one applies one damage to another ship with a health value of the matching color while this one applies one damage to any ship, regardless of its color. Each unit has a black or red health value and will be easier to target with that color dice. A blank result does nothing. Once all damage is assigned, the defending player can play tactic cards to block the damage if they have any. Any unit with damage equaling or exceeding its health is destroyed and removed from the board. However, if they haven't yet attacked this round, they don't leave the board until after that happens. Following this, if both players have ground units in the system, a ground battle takes place. Again, this works the same way, only now using ground tactic cards and affecting ground units. Once both ships and ground units in that system have battled, each player has the opportunity to retreat. To retreat, a player takes one of the leaders they had present in that combat and moves them to an adjacent system. Then they can move any of the units there to that system following the normal rules. If possible, this must be a system that contains another of their units or loyalty marker. A player can't retreat if they have no leader, or if they can't reach a system that doesn't contain an enemy unit, or one that isn't the same system the enemy just moved from. There can only be one retreat per player per combat, even if they have multiple leaders in that system. Ground units and TIE fighters can be left behind during a retreat, but all ships must leave that system. If the Rebel transport ship is the only Rebel ship left in a system, it's forced to retreat or else it's destroyed. Combat rounds continue until one side has no remaining units, either in space or on the planet. If any surviving units still have damage on them once combat is resolved, that damage is removed. Note that some units are structures, which do not add dice, but have their own special abilities. Once built, structures cannot be moved. At the end of a combat, if rebel structures are in a system with imperial ground units, and there are no rebel ground units to defend against them, then those structures are destroyed. Each player also has two action cards, which can be revealed and played at a time indicated on the card itself. Some of them are activated immediately as soon as they are gained. If an action card has a leader depicted on it, then that leader must be present in the relevant combat or system in order to be used. Imperial players also have certain mission cards that will allow them access to the Project Card deck. These are special missions with powerful effects, such as constructing the Death Star. The Death Star under construction unit cannot be moved until it is built into the regular Death Star. This unit doesn't count as a ship or a moon, in fact, it is a space station. The completed Death Star cannot take any damage. Instead, Rebels will have to find the Death Star plan's objective card to attempt to take it down. If any form of the Death Star is present in a combat, the Imperial side will not be able to retreat. They must stand by to protect it. The Empire can also gain access to a Super Laser, which has the power to destroy entire systems. Any Rebel units in a destroyed system are destroyed themselves, while Imperial units have the chance to escape and leaders are unaffected. In future rounds, ground units will only be able to enter this system if they're being transported by a ship, and ground combat will no longer take place here. Some cards have effects that apply attachment rings to leaders. 
If a rebel leader is captured, they get a captured ring. The Empire can move them and interrogate them as mission cards instruct. This leader cannot return to their pool or be moved by the rebel player, and they don't prevent movement during the command phase. If they're left in a system without any Imperial units, they are rescued immediately and the ring is removed. If on their turn a player chooses to pass rather than reveal a mission or activate a system, they forfeit their turns for the remainder of the round. Once both players have passed, the refresh phase begins. All leaders left on the board or unrevealed mission cards return to their respective pools. Players draw two new mission cards to their hand, then discard down to a max hand size of 10. The Empire gets to draw two probe cards to look at secretly, eliminating two possibilities for the Rebel's hidden base, while the Rebel gets to draw an additional objective card. Next, the time token advances one space on this track at the side of the board. The space it moves to could contain a recruit icon, a build icon, or both. The recruit icon allows both players to draw two cards from their action decks. Choose one to keep and place the other at the bottom of the deck. Now you can take any leader depicted at the bottom of that card and place them into your leader pool to be utilized in a future round. You can also put this card face down to be activated later or immediately depending on its text. A build icon on the track lets each player begin to build new units according to the systems they control. Each system you have loyalty in and that doesn't contain any enemy units lets you build two new units according to its resource icons. Check your faction sheet to determine exactly which unit each icon represents. Next to these icons is a number between 1 and 3, which corresponds to the build queue on the other side of the board. Each player has their own set of three spaces in this queue. Place the indicated unit types from your supply onto the indicated numbered space. Then, at the end of this phase, both players can move all the units in their queue down to the next lowest space. Once a unit moves off of the one space, it has been built and can be deployed onto any of that player's loyal systems, no more than two per system. Some effects allow the Empire to subjugate systems, as indicated by this side of their loyalty tokens. A subjugated system only allows the Empire to build the unit indicated by the leftmost resource icon, not both, but can be deployed to as normal. You should also look out for sabotage markers. If played by the Rebels, these markers block a system's resources and prevent players from building or deploying there until the Empire can remove them. After the refresh phase is complete, the game continues with a new round. The game ends in an Imperial victory if the Empire can locate the Rebel base and hold at least one of their own units there without any Rebel units being present. If they manage to destroy the system containing the Rebel base, that also counts as a win for the Empire. Rebels win through the play of their objective cards. Objective cards feature special conditions, which, if met, can be revealed at specified times, either during combat or at the start of the refresh phase. Objective cards will give the Rebels reputation points, as indicated in the top left corner. Each point moves the reputation marker back one space on the board track. If that marker ever shares a space with the time marker, the game ends in a Rebel victory. Rebellion can also be played with teams of two or as a 2v1 game. In a team game, most of the rules are the same, but now teammates take turns controlling different leaders and playing different cards. If you're just playing with the Star Wars Rebellion base game, that's it, you're done, get out of here. But if you also have the Rise of the Empire expansion, I'll talk about the differences now. This expansion adds a variety of new cards and units. The units can be built alongside your old units just like before, but you should brush up on their unique abilities. There are new green dice rolled by certain units. New leaders also have smaller skill icons known as minor skills, which allow them to roll an additional green die if assigned to a matching mission. Some cards make use of target markers, which can be played onto the board and removed by a lone ground unit for a special effect. A new restriction on leaders means you can only have 8 in your pool at one time, discarding any extras if you have them. But the biggest changes by far come in the expansion's new cinematic combat style. With this variant in play, players each have their own advanced tactics deck for space and ground combat. At the start of combat, players can look through the relevant deck and choose any card to play face down. When ready, both players reveal their cards simultaneously, then activate them, starting with the current player. Each card has two effects, and each player chooses just one to activate. If an effect has the icon of a specific unit, that unit must be present for it to be chosen. A player can also choose not to activate either effect. If a player has a card with a cancel effect, it activates first and negates the other card. After use, a tactic card is discarded. It won't be usable again until the entire deck runs out, at which point the cards are reshuffled. The tactic cards from the base game are no longer used. Instead, your leader's tactic values allow you to re-roll that number of dice, depending on which type of combat it is, once per attack. Likewise, dice can't be used to draw or activate cards. Instead, you can use this symbol to remove one point of damage from one of your units. 
Units will be destroyed at the end of the battle round if they have enough damage on them. If a player has structures in the system but no other ground units, those structures survive another round of combat as long as the controlling player rolled at least one die during the previous battle. In conclusion, assign missions, position leaders, battle your enemy, secure the Rebel Alliance, or destroy it. That's Star Wars Rebellion in a nutshell. Did you get all that?